All right, it was day two from the Southern District of New York in the Doquan and Terra versus the SEC case. And it was actually pretty exciting today when Judge Rakoff went off and yelled at both sides to wrap up the day in court. We'll get into exactly why he said he is compelled to do something that he has never done in his career on the bench and why he chose to end the day with such high drama. But the day began with much less drama when the SEC called two key witnesses to kick off their attempts to try and show what exactly went wrong. If you remember from day one, there's two prongs to their thesis here in terms of what fraud was committed by both Do Doquan and Terraform Labs. Uh, the first prong has everything to do with what they marketed when it comes to Chai. Specifically, the idea of Chai, the company that Doquan co-founded with his co-founder Daniel Shin, was using the Terraform blockchain, and they called on two investors who had been led to believe that was the case, and both of them had said that that was a key piece of why they invested. So it's pretty clear with what the SEC is trying to do with their first witnesses. Technically, on day one, their first witness was an average, quote-unquote, retail investor in someone who bought Luna and UST. But the two witnesses from today were institutional investors, beginning with Boris Revson from Game Theory Group, who later went on to Republic, as well as another uh, investor as well, who also said Chai uh, was a big piece of why he chose to invest when he was at Galaxy Digital and also mentioned Mike Novogratz, who we all know was one of the main lunatics who had talked about the Terra project who have interviewed as well. Before they started with any testimony, Judge Rakoff actually walked through the first kind of instructions for the jury, which again was just explaining the two prongs to the SEC's thesis and allegations around the fraud that was allegedly committed by Doquan and Terra, and also instructing them to kind of go piece by piece with this and await further instructions at the end of all the witnesses we're gonna hear from over the two week trial. I'm going to skip over what we heard from the first witness, Boris, because it wasn't too exciting. Where you started to see what the SEC was trying to do with the testimony was actually in Mr. Cole's testimony from Galaxy. The SEC took their time to walk through exactly what his background was in terms of investing in crypto projects and specifically what was appealing about Luna and UST from Terra and what Mr. Cole heard from Doquan about the projects. The first piece of evidence that they brought up was really around this idea of users on the Terra blockchain and what made Terra unique. Mr. Cole testified that one of the big pieces of that was users and transactions on chain. And they dug deeper into that to show that the Chai Payments Network was a big piece of that. Specifically and importantly, the SEC asked if you knew that Chai activity on the Terra blockchain was actually just being copied and didn't know that merchants themselves were using the blockchain, would that have impacted your decision to invest in Terra? To which Mr. Cole replied, absolutely. So that was kind of one key piece about where the SEC is going to be taking the next part of their case, I believe, before the defense takes over. And also on uh, beyond that, you also had the SEC kind of asking Mr. Cole also about why he was sending some of these emails to Mike Novogratz and other people at Galaxy before they made their investments and walking through the key risks. Mr. Cole actually highlighted four um, when it comes to what the risks were around an investing in Terra Luna. One, market risk, which kind of applies to every cryptocurrency out there. Two, Luna supply expansion risk, which is basically a death spiral, the idea of the way that UST and Luna worked that you could potentially have this death spiral happen. Three, Luna liquidity risk, just that people needed to be able to buy Luna for this all to work. And four, regulatory risk, which is pretty cut and dry around what Korea might do with a project like that. There were objections though, as the SEC asked about why they wanted to show these documents. And then there was a sidebar that you couldn't really hear what Judge Rakoff and the two teams were talking about. But eventually the SEC made their point and closed with their witness, again asking the question, would you have changed your idea to invest in Terra if you knew Chai was not actually using the blockchain? And again, Mr. Cole said yes. That brings us to Cross, the last thing that happened on day two in terms of what the jury saw, which was the defense lawyers asking the same witness 
why he was drawn to Terra and why he chose to invest while he was there at Galaxy, the $4 million investment. Interestingly, Judge Rakoff actually jumped in at multiple points during the cross and added questions of his own, including one to clarify what the differences between UST as a stable coin and other stable coins were. Of course, Mr. Cole answered that UST was an algorithmic stable coin, which didn't really depend on assets in a bank like other stable coins, which if you followed Terra from our reporting or any other reporting out there, really, you would know that piece. Maybe the jury didn't. But where things started to get interesting was where the defense clearly was trying to lead the jury in this testimony was raising other issues that were non-Terra specific. That is risks that might associate with any currency that is pegged to a dollar, not just cryptocurrencies and not just algorithmic stable coins. But at one point, the defense attorney actually asked about specific risks that were highlighted in the Terra white paper. The first of which was highlighted in that original white paper, and they called this investor's attention to what was labeled uh, 4.3 in the Terra white paper price shocks, which reads, quote, arguably the most lethal risk to the survival of a stable coin is a sudden price shock. And uh, clearly the witness testified as to what that means in this idea of if the price drops, you might have a bunch of people trying to get out of that position, hence the death spiral. The second part of that in the white paper is that in the case of a shorting attack, a well-resourced attacker can eat through fat reserves if they don't offer full collateralization. And the defense attorney went on to ask about what he meant. And Mr. Cole highlighted this idea that someone who might want to attack a peg could do so if they wanted to and knew that they had more money than you know who might be supporting the peg would have to defend it. Then they went on to a very famous example outside of crypto in which that happened, which of course a lot of people in the in the courtroom actually knew where this was going and the witness talked about George Soros breaking the pound famously in what he tried to do by betting against that peg and then that's where shit hit the fan. The SEC objected to that on relevance. The witness answered too quickly for the judge to intervene. He moved to strike that. The defense attorney tried again and asked about a different example. The SEC objected again on grounds of foundation and then the defense attorney basically tried to back up and establish a foundation about what happened with the Terra collapse. And then point blank asked, is a shorting attack what happened with Terra in 2022? And then there was another objection and basically you saw the defense, all right, I need to back up and get out of this line of questioning because it's not working. But I think it kind of speaks to exactly what this case is all about, which is, is this failure or is this fraud? Again, if you haven't watched our original award-winning mini-doc on what happened with Terra. That's what this whole case boils down to, is whether or not the jury will believe that this is a case of, you know, a founder trying to build something that didn't work, uh, which I think is actually kind of part of the genius in the way that this was built and the way that Doe pursued this project, and whether or not it kind of falls on everyone who should have understood that these risks are always inherent to exactly what they were trying to do and should have known that the signs were there. And I think that's what we're going to see over the rest of the days of this trial from various witnesses. I will say, Joe, just kind of like where this went on, they didn't finish the full cross. Judge Rakoff jumped in because he had to go. They were only supposed to go till three and this was about at 3.15. He basically said, look, we're not gonna finish up. Let's call it there. And then as the jury left, that's where the fireworks really started to come out because Judge Rakoff was clearly at that point pretty pissed at the way that this had gone with the early witnesses saying that, look, this is a fraud case. You really only need to talk about lies as they existed, whether it came from Doquan or Terra, that led to eliciting these investments, whether it's kind of from the retail investors or from the institutional ones. And he basically said the cross dealt with Econ 101 and that he was jokingly and you know sarcastically saying, I was thrilled to learn about some of these market ideas that you threw out there before he quite literally yelled, I don't see the relevance. Uh, and the whole courtroom got very quiet at that point when they realized this guy's not joking, he's actually screaming and quite angry. And that's when he said, I've never had to do this in my, I think it was like 20 plus years on the bench. I've never had to set time limits for these lines of questioning before. 
But basically, if, you know, and this was directed at both the SEC and the defense attorneys, but if you can't be more on point in your line of questionings, if you can't be more specific and pinpoint in your questioning, then I basically will need to set time limits because there's so much weaving around. And so he asked both sides to come in early tomorrow to talk about what these lies more specifically are, and hopefully that will lead to line of questionings that are a little bit more specific. But it was awkward, I think. It was a little it was a little tense to wrap up the day. Judge Rakoff had to go run to teach at Columbia, which I think yesterday he had to run to teach at NYU, so I honestly don't know how many schools Judge Rakoff teaches at, but he's doing a lot here. And we'll see if anything gets more specific on day three. Of course, we'll be covering all of these in daily recaps. Let us know in the comments if you're enjoying these. Throw a like and, of course, subscribe to the channel if we should keep doing more of these in daily recaps because there is a lot being thrown out in these cross-examinations, a lot of interesting details from these witnesses, including kind of how Galaxy chose to approve of this investment and just how long some of these investors had looked at Terra, even before, of course, Mike Novogratz got the famous Luna tattoo. If you have any questions, though, beyond what we've covered in day one and day two, throw those in the comments as well, and we'll be sure to answer uh, what we can from the courtroom through the early days of the case and over the course of the next couple weeks.